all kinds of genealogies in this uh, in this story, right? Um, one of them uh, being alluded to as the, uh, the French Robespierre uh, terror and whatever uh, uh, genealogy, and then the American difference to that. Um, now, one of the questions would then be, what is that difference, and how is that uh, okay? So the Charles Taylor, who we will see later uh, in the uh, series, has a uh, very interesting piece in which he compares the um, genealogies of the idea of liberty and democracy, etc., uh, in the French model and the American model. So I just uh, want to flag that that is a, that it is a possibility to go uh, somewhat deeper into what are these models of uh, represent of dealing with political representation and democracy when you uh, look at America's uh, difference from from France. But what I, I want to ask is uh, is something about Wilson. Uh, as you know, I have an interest in uh, consumption. Uh, uh, Wilson uh, uh, was quoted in a recent book by Victoria de Gracia on uh, what she called the ir irresistible empire. Uh, uh, Wilsonian market capitalism. Uh, and Wilson said, well, we will conquer the world through um, consumption. Uh, now, that element seems to be lacking in your idea of America. And it seems to be, in my view, one of the most potent ideas uh, of uh, America. Uh, namely, a, uh, uh, a place of uh, irresistible goods which actually flood the market and therefore also the resistances against that. Uh, flood of uh, consumption goods and consumerism, so anti-consumerism in Maoism, in Gandhi, in India, and of course all kinds of Islamic movements. And the flip side of, uh, of consumption is always production, of course. Now, what I find striking is that the, uh, the Bush clique, as you call them, um, uh, Cheney and so on, uh, Cheney had a direct relation to Halliburton, uh, a big construction firm, a big military firm too. So there is a, uh, an interest, of course, uh, in uh, building and, uh, and creating consumer goods, not only consumer goods, but also places, material life, as it were, in the Middle East and in other places where uh, you have majority Muslim population. So America plays a big role in consumption patterns. Uh, there was, after the first Gulf War, a deliberate uh, attempt by uh, the Americans to conquer the souls of uh, the Middle Eastern youth by uh, promoting uh, American pop songs, etc., into the area. So it's, it's, it's a kind of bastion of consumerism, of consumption culture, but it's also a very big player in oil and in uh, uh, production. Uh, so these two capitalistic sides and the resistances against that and the relation to that from a Islamic point of view would be interesting to look at that. Well, there's different aspects. One of it has to do with gambling and the ways in which there's all sorts of discussions of the ways in which America's economy from the beginning has been uh, both a gambling and a, um, now just spacing the word, a uh, counterfeit. It's been both a gambling and a counterfeit economy. Um, so that's uh, the, the, I think, the more hidden economy, say. Uh, and then at the same time, you have the linkages with also uh, Bin Laden coming out of a big construction uh, company. And then what's very interesting is that part of the authority of Bin Laden is in his ability to resist that, so that he lives in a, he lives the life of the ascetic uh, Muslim living in a cave, which has all kinds of resonances to classic Islamic history. Um, so that he both, uh, but the thing is that I just saw an interview with him and uh, Peter Berger asks him, well, will oil prices go up if you would conquer the Middle East? Uh, what would you do with oil prices? And he says, well, we would have market processes. We would have the laws of the market. And yes, of course, the prices would go up because they're being kept artificially low by the stooges of the Americans. Um, so you both have that he agrees on the market, on the working of the market, but of course that that means that the prices go up. Mm. 
So I think that the, at a number of levels that you can, what I think, what I find most interesting is the question of, of what exactly is the dynamic between, on the one hand, the, the um, attraction to American consumer culture, American economic possibilities, and then at the same time all kinds of resistances to it. Uh, whether it's a kind of uh, gentle resistance through Islamic banking, which is which was growing in America until September 11th, and then it drastically decreased as people moved from Islamic banking to real estate, uh, which now I'm sure is also decreasing. Um, so how it is that Muslims position themselves relative to uh, American to to Americanist economics? And then the question of consumption, um, I want to bring in, and also how, how it is that women and sexuality are consumed. Um, but of course, that's a, that's a critical aspect. Um, well, thank you for a very uh, interesting and uh, rich uh, lecture. I was thinking about you kissing kin, you sketched the image of uh, Bush and Bin Laden kissing, and maybe the help. I was thinking of all these old Communist Party views. <laughs> always kissing each other and that didn't help so um, well kissing may be enabling but you can also be forced as you uh, said in the beginning um, well I would like to ask um, two things one more technical question and uh, I think one more broader kind um, uh, you sketched uh, the uh, revolution and tradition in France uh, starting with uh, Robespierre about the uh, relation between virtue and terror, um, and then you made some comparisons with, you could say, the Enlightenment uh, uh, side of the American Revolution. Um, and my impression was that um, kind of things like utopia, um, uh, being too virtuous, uh, having uh, investing religion and religious energy into these revolutionary movements, having extreme experiences, uh, sublime experiences, uh, romantic uh, feelings of uh, um, domination and sublimation, um, that all these things in these traditions um, were the enemy. And I was reminded of, uh, of course, an, an older, uh, maybe old-fashioned, but also venerated debate in which uh, uh, philosophers like uh, Isaiah Berlin and Karl Popper, of course, also had as their enemy all this kind of utopianism, uh, uh, religious, uh, uh, critical unbelievers unbel in, in uh, the higher causes. And my technical question would be, um, how do you relate this discourse? Uh, are we still in it? Is it still relevant uh, uh, for us? Because um, the, the uh, downside of it is that this discourse was of course made in also a conflict situation uh, again between liberalism and, and communism so that would be the technical question and the more broader question is um, all these religious and utopist and virtuous urges um, are they things from the outside have they nothing to do with us and can we really understand them um, if we are, uh, well, looking at these things as alien or as things that are other than what we would like to be? Thank you very much. Um, I think I wouldn't so much say either that they're alien or that they're bad or there's, there's something to avoid. I think what I'm interested in is, is what's the dynamic interrelation um, so the alternative, I think, the alternative discourse to what you're talking about, right, is the rationalist discourse. But rationalist discourse can become just as impassioned, utopian, hegemonic, dominating, and so forth. So I don't think, so, so I wouldn't locate um, the, the, the problem in passion or in this particular discourse or this particular kind of logic. I think what's interesting then is what is the dynamic uh, between the different components. Um, so when I'm looking at America and France, what I find interesting is the question of where does terror enter and how is it that terror has a different place, a different location? Because when I first was looking at it, what struck me is you have the French Revolution, right? And it starts off as an ideal uh, revolution and turns into terror. 
And in the process, you see the ways in which utopianism and the ways in which liberalism and emancipation and so forth have within it all the seeds of oppressive violence that are the very thing that we're rooting out. Um, so then you look at the United States, and it and it's appar apparently has a very different kind of development. So I was trying to, so what struck me is then the question is, where is the terror? And for me, it really is in that separated, segregated racial terrain uh, that then has made it subject to a very different kind of logic, a very different kind of politics, a different kind of passion. Um, so when I'm doing that comparison between the United States and France, that's really what I'm interested in, is where is the location of terror and how is it that it's making its way into these kinds of emancipatory <coughs> movements. Um, I don't know if I've done, so, so those are the two things, is that you're looking at the dynamic, that it's unavoidable, that it's not alien, but inherent. Uh, so what you're looking at is how does it work? What is the position, what is the relation between, for example, the passionate and the rationalist, the emancipatory and the, the um, destructive? I'm really looking for the, the point where things go wild and wrong. Because you can accept uh, these kind of motivations and urges and passions uh, because you can say, okay, uh, um, they are part of uh, uh, our society and our personal uh, maker also. And uh, they are, uh, in a way, necessary to get things done in, in, in a positive way. But somewhere along the line, um, 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 well, it becomes uh, terrorist or undemocratic or intolerant or whatever you would like to call it. Um, and um, well, I was wondering, is, are these not very uh, uh, old-fashioned a question we are asking. Uh, this question I should pose to myself also because these are the categories we are thinking in, and I think uh, uh, um, the reason to look into these things uh, also is um, well, um, that we are worried about what is happening. Uh, well, I think there's, there's different things. I, uh, I mean, part of it might be just that I'm a bit younger, and so then I'm coming to the question of, of violence, you know, from a different moment and a different background, a different experience. Um, so the questions that, that, you know, you've been thinking about for a while, but that certain uh, generations or my Americanness, um, so there could be a datedness to them, um, that, but of course I'm not experiencing them in that way. At the same time, um, I think what it is, is I'm trying to develop a different way of account. I think we have all kinds of accounts of violence, and we have uh, accounts of what is the relation of violence to religion that are um, simplistic, reductive, unhelpful, useless. And so then the question is, well, if you're going to have a more useful uh, discussion of violence and where that violence is coming from, and where I'm looking on the one hand is what kinds of strategic decisions are people making, what kinds of strategic mistakes. Uh, and that's what's very interesting. I mean, you see, you know, if you're looking at Bin Laden, it was simply, he made a huge strategic mistake. He thought that in having defeated the Russians in Afghanistan and having driven the Americans out of Somalia, it would be a piece of cake to um, attack the Americans now, and after a few times, the Americans would just uh, run away and the rest of the Muslim world would rise up. Uh, and instead, it turned out very, very different. And if you look at the history of what happens with violence, for example, in the 1970s, the same kinds of things happen, that the results of violence are unpredictable. And at the same time, if you look at who is it who becomes a terrorist, how is it that people turn to violence, that's also completely unpredictable. So that, I think, is, is what's important, is to find a way of talking in some kind of structured way about the unpredictability of violence and the consequences of violence uh, in the context of uh, democracy, enlightenment, and so forth, that also have hugely violent components, which usually get erased in the kind of discourse that we have in our public debates and among our politicians. Well, could there be a, a more open way of looking at it without surrendering to, to uh, uh, in the end, uh, uh, being indifferent to 
moral questions. And um, well, um, that is something um, I have no answers, uh, and I don't think that there are any easy answers. Well, sometimes I'm wondering if there may be new venues uh, in, in looking at these matters. Uh, but well, when I'm thinking about uh, these things, there's always uh, there are these nagging uh, politically correct and, and, and moral uh, uh, warnings, warning signs that go blinking. So, uh, well, it's just a problem. Uh, I think uh, many uh, uh, would share. But do you mean by politically correct, for example, the, the... I, I mean it in a positive sense. Mm -hmm. so, so, well. Um, well, a more European example would be the, the veneration for, uh, for the theories of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, mm -hmm. which of course is a classic problem in, in uh, well, uh, how do you look at him uh, and, and what kind of uh, moral and political uh, criteria uh, do you use in, in, in looking at him and uh, uh, bringing too many uh, makes it impossible to understand what he was saying and, and, and uh, trying to understand fully. I think you should not do in all uh, aspects of his thoughts. So, so that's the kind of issue I think uh, that may be also translated into these kind of uh, uh, discussions and studies we have about uh, uh, religions and, and the, the way they uh, shape the lives of people. In, in societies and, and are interconnected with violence and, and uh, those kind of uh, things. Okay, I think, well, because I think I see what you're saying, except the thing is, I think that the ways it works, it works in terms of, of uh, uh, politics, uh, of movements that uh, deploy religion in political and the interests of certain kinds of political goals or to deploy politics in the interests of religious goals. I think that that's a much more, it's a less um, subtle, difficult kind of thing than understanding Nietzsche. Um, which is different than understanding religious experiences. You know, what, I mean, simply understanding how does one person work, you know, that's as difficult as understanding Nietzsche. So in those kinds of terms, of course. Uh, but in terms of understanding, for example, what, what, what kinds of strategies were there? I mean, unless you're really trying to include personal psychology into an analysis of how a group works or the kinds of move, the ways in which a movement works, but if you're not really looking at the individual psychology of the individual actors, then I think that there's um, that there's a whole different set of questions that are brought to bear than the kinds of questions that you bring to bear by Nietzsche or the kinds of dangers. Nietzsche is dangerous in a different way. Well, maybe the problem is to, to, to try to understand what makes these people tick. And, and how do you go about this? And, 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 uh, maybe tick is really the appropriate term. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, I was thinking of the, um, well, why should I call it maybe the, the, the semi-public career of uh, uh, Peter von Veer himself, I think you've been there in looking uh, in other than the normally accepted way to, uh, to religion. And, uh, well, uh, I think you encountered all kinds of uh, interesting reactions there in the past decades. Yeah, I think what, what you are saying is basically, is there a possibility to engage these things? Uh, and I think we're, what we do is engage them. Uh, this is an intellectual pursuit. And it is not more difficult to understand anything. And it's not more difficult to understand my mother than, uh, say, Bin Laden. Um, the knowledges which you have to bring to bear is, uh, are really quite varied. And uh, the good thing of a kind of interdisciplinary approach, like uh, Mark is presenting here, is that you bring a lot of very different kinds of knowledges to bear on this topic. Because basically you find already that you cannot pursue it in a 
straightforward genealogy. There is too much mix, there's too much going on at the same time. So you're trying to actually to, that's the way I read it at, at least, uh, in a kind of more fragmentary way to see certain elements which otherwise are excluded from the discussion. Now, if that is the case, then of course, um, uh, in every, in any nationalist pursuit, or in any nationalist, uh, or in any environment, in fact, all these questions have kind of uh, a kind of moral salient. So, if you would say, for example, which I always said in my classes on nationalism, that we are in fact Germans, and people really hate that, they don't like that. Uh, if ever, if you say, well, Bin Laden is a fascist, yeah, that's really acceptable. When, but when you say, well, basically Cheney is also a fascist, and these people are in a kind of moral universe which seem to share certain things, which may be caused by globalization, then you have an interesting argument. Then you go further than what people would immediately say. Now, I think this is normally always the case, and so um, nothing to be upset about, actually, uh, as long as you are not attacking the street, of course. <laughs> question actually how do we understand terrorism? Is that your question? Is it possible to understand terrorism? Well that could be one of the questions. Um, and the environment and motivation and well the sacrifice that goes with it. Uh, the, the, the kind of um, well mental outlook that goes with it. Uh, uh, and of course you can make uh, 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 comparisons. Um, but what I think, and I, I think uh, uh, Peter is right in saying that we are trying to circumvent this, but um, we have this blind spot for, for, for religion and for irrationality and for mysticism, uh, which of course uh, for many people in many situations is, is yeah, well, very important in a conscious or unconscious way. And maybe it also is for us uh, uh, when we are totally honest. But we try in our uh, discussions and discourses to, uh, to to analyze it. I think from well, more or less uh, as something maybe not alien, but something that is an object that is to be uh, explained um, and. Well, maybe we are uh, missing dimensions uh, in, in understanding um, what is, uh, well, what is the, the, the origin of, of these uh, 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 ways of uh, behaving and, and thinking and feeling, and also what the effects might be, and, and uh, well, in the end, um, what eventually. Uh, to do about it if you want to come to something old-fashioned like a dialogue. Where I think I'm looking at it differently is, at least the assumptions I'm starting with, is that religion isn't particularly distinctive in the ways in which it deals with rationality and irrationality. So that if I'm talking about the terror in, in a democratic moment, or the terror in the, the revolutionary or the liberal moment, and so forth, there's deep irrationalism in there deep violence. Um, so that religion in and of itself isn't distinctive for having irrationalism or for being more rationalist or, or something like that. It's, that isn't at all what's going to make the religious religious. Um, at the same time, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of studies out there, right, for, for where is it that violent movements come from and that you have this combination of, of individual psychology in combination with certain kinds of group processes in relation to certain kinds of environments so that when you have a repressive environment, it tends to generate more violence than a less repressive environment if you have political channels and so forth. So there's all sorts of analyses like that, that under what kinds of situations you tend to get violent political movements or do you get less violent political movements. Um, but you're aware of those, so I think you, you, you must be asking um, a different question. And I guess that's what I'm wondering, if you think that, I mean, are you saying that religion is different from other sorts of things, or is that you're saying, in fact, 
I mean, you're, you're starting from the same place I am, which is what it is. We, as in, we in the social sciences uh, in the West, uh, tend to look at religion as something that is uh, different, maybe outdated. Uh, uh, we are a bit suspicious, suspicious of it. And, uh, um, well, maybe we know that um, uh, it can be a part of uh, rationality. As you mentioned the example of the, the, the witch hunts, uh, where the, the rational side were the witch hunters who made these classifications uh, that were very scientific for their day. Uh, against older, uh, more maybe mystic or, or, or uh, 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 romantic beliefs in, in uh, witchcraft in, in general. So, um, of course, these combinations are there. Uh, but I think we, if, if there is a bias, um, we, we are, I think, as a whole, suspicious of what religion can do. And, and one of the, the uh, classic examples, of course, is a study uh, like that of Norman Cohen who sued the millennium, um, uh, in which you get this specification of all the dangers that can happen when people uh, uh, really get to believe that they are in the right because then they are slaughtering their fellow men. Um, and um, well, I think that's, that, that is a, a, a reflex um, that in, in many of our uh, concepts uh, still is present. Maybe we should try to get rid of it. Uh, I don't know exactly how, um, but the, some of the examples you see of people are trying to lean over backwards uh, in, well, trying not to belittle uh, uh, religion, religion um, are only, uh, they'll end up being very uncritical about this. So, yeah, I mean, I think you have different kinds of discussions going on. So then on the one hand, you, know, you have some sort of, uh, kind of classical field where, where people are saying, oh, wait, maybe religion isn't dying out. Maybe religion isn't completely irrational. Maybe, you know, we should think about religion. We should take religion seriously. Um, so you have people who are starting out, yeah, from that classical framework, kind of modernization theory, and starting to think, oh, we need to rethink really modernization theory and secularization and so forth. I think you have a whole other group of people at the same time who um, are working out from religion itself um, and you know engaging in you know I mean if you look at for example um, Derrida or uh, you know a whole group of philosophers I mean even Judith, Judith Butler who's, who's pretty secularist but still looking for ways to engage certain aspects of religion and religious history um, or yeah what's Abu Mahmoud is doing. Um, going to be speaking uh, in the spring. So the, all the you know, all the, uh, various speakers for the series. So I think you have those people who are working out from religion. Um, and then you have the whole question, I think that there's a third terrain, and that's the one that I find interesting and that I'm, I'm finding out how to, how, to, how to put it into words. Um, but that whole question of the ways in which the, the religious and the political continually engage each other. Um, and are, are both continually, and I think that's unavoidable, uh, so they're continually putting pressure on each other, continually developing a critique of each other, and then the question of how is it that you can have, take this critique seriously, the critique of religion on the politics and the critique of the political on the religious. Uh, so I would say that that's a third field, so you can be working from the secular, you can be working from the religious, and then that whole question of the, the mutual, though not necessarily complementary, complementary critique of each other. Well, the question is very much related to this, and maybe you've already answered it, uh, because I thought that your lecture was very interesting, and you said a lot of interesting things, but I was wondering about the political project for the political sector, and I was thinking whether or maybe how um, comparing these two extreme discourses can help us with that political project and maybe that's related to these other questions whether whether we should ask different questions um, but I was yeah, wondering about these comparing these two extreme cases and does that really help us to understand or comprehend the political situation better, or are we just going to say they're both bad, but both bad? And you know, but do you know what I mean? It's, it's, um, yeah. 
Well, I think there's two things. One is, I think it's unavoidable to discuss them simply because they're, they're the framework within which so much of the discussion is taking place. So then my interest is seeing in how can you shift the framework of the discussion of these things instead of it having to be something that hampers the kinds of insights that we have. How can it be something that gives us more insights? Um, at the same time, what I'm wondering about is what do you mean with political project of the post-secular? Because is it a political project? I mean, I haven't defined what it could be yet, huh? but I think there, there is this possibility of trying to change the discourse. I see that in your story as well. So if that could be a political project, um, yeah. What's the difference between a political project and an intellectual project? Of course, the same. Yeah. Can it be the same? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah but, but I don't know if it can be the same. I mean, that's, that's always like if you look at feminism, right? Yeah. Um, that's always one of the big problems when feminism gets into the academia. Um, is either it's too political or it's too scholarly. Um, but it has, there's, there's always a problem with combining the intellectual and the political. Uh, because then the question is when push comes to shove, which one do you give, which one do you privilege? Um, you know, do you privilege insight or do you privilege, um, you know, political objectives? Mm -hmm. um, so, but I mean, the thing is, I guess for me, the, the post-secular, it's not a project, it's, it's simply, uh, you know, the recognition that the secular has a horizon, uh, which, you know, and that's to me the same as with post-modernity. It's not so much the end of modernity or the end of secularism as a project. It, it, it persists. There's all kinds of groups deeply committed, in fact, more deeply committed to secularism than there have been. So it can, uh, but at the same time, um, the, the, the grand narrative of secularism as the horizon of human history uh, doesn't hold, it, doesn't, it uh, doesn't have kind of an unquestioned ascendancy, which it had for a long time among particular classes, the classes that were making our narratives. So I think that the post-secular is that, simply that the secular has um, you know, now lost that kind of position. Um, and then, yeah, the question, it becomes a project, but I don't know if, um, you know, what the relation is between the post-secular as a project and particular religious movements in reaction to secularism and then other kinds of religious movements in combination with secularism. And so if you're looking at um, movements or developments uh, that have a political edge, I think then post-secularism is actually a constellation of movements and developments, some of which are going against secularism and some of which are working collaboratively with secularism in ways that secularism itself couldn't imagine 50 years ago. But is it also the case that there is a, a, a toughening up of the secularist front? If, if we just define, depends how you actually define secularism. If we take the standard political secularism definition, distinction of state and church, that is stronger than ever. That is gathering momentum in, in the great deal of actually formerly developing world and countries, and, and has certainly gathered a lot of momentum among the minorities and gays and women that you just mentioned. So it depends a bit on what you mean what the secularism to, to, to begin with. And I also got worried when you said <clears throat> secularism is the teleological end of world history, using my language, but but I don't know who would argue that, where, where you would see that even in. in you know, accepting Freud's atheistic text when he really rips religion apart. And I, I don't recognize that there's always a certain recognition of the importance of the spiritual in the making of world history. And certainly, and uh, even in Marxist revolutionary politics, the revolution we were talking about last year, revolution is the magical moment, is the eruption of this the state of grace where finally people get it and they pull down tyrannies. So there is this element of almost divine illumination that people get it and they destroy heterosexuality, they pull down patriarchy. So, so, so it's, it's, it's always been there. So, so the recognition that the spiritual, that faith is part of the political project is, has always been integral to some of the most secularist ideology, I'm thinking of Marxism specifically. So, so which secularism has no future? The political one, I don't see that. I see that as gathering a lot of momentum. Um, the diversification of practices, that's true, of the different religious practices, and the more the merrier. But Dawkins says that that spells the end of religion. The more diversified it gets, the more consumeristic it gets. And, uh, and uh, as long as, of course, I wanted to challenge that, because I wonder how you 
me the secularist. Of course, I am a secularist, in case you haven't noticed. But the definition I think, was my, my challenge. Well, I think there's different things. One of the things you were talking about is that the secularist position has hardened. Um, and I think that there's a difference between ideological hardening and practical institutional hardening. I was just wondering you know, if there was a way of making uh, concrete you know, this importance of uh, beliefs in general, and religious beliefs as a particularly intense kind of belief, uh, in a way which uh, was less moralized, <laughs> you know, less uh, rigid, but in this kind of macro interactions that are taking place every day, even, you know, people watching a, a video of the Jihad on, on YouTube, you know, this kind of exchanges that are taking place at the level of populations and users. I thought, I was wondering if you found that of any interest in terms of unblocking <laughs> some of these larger issues. I'm also for this residency, these two weeks I'm spending here, is exactly on, the, you know, whether it's possible to use topology to understand uh, the relationship between Iraq and the United States as two geopolitical territories. So, just, just throw me in. <laughs> okay, well, you've, you've touched on a lot of interesting things. Um, I think different questions. One is the, the question of, of religion and, and associating religion with belief, right? Because religion can be all different sorts of things. So it can be belief, it can be practices, it can be, you know, it can be different um, it can be rituals, it can, you know, so, so simply in seeing it, I wouldn't see it as simply belief. In, uh, in the world of communication, mm -hmm. it's not flat on this one and others, not in general, but it just, you know, if you just take its play on communication, it appears as one belief. It doesn't mean that it's just belief, but mm -hmm. when you read conversations, you know, right. around the state of relationship, but for example, I mean, people deal in, in all sorts of ways with the kinds of information that they encounter on the internet. Um, and they also have all kinds of ways of projecting themselves onto the internet. So for example, people, people love to change genders uh, when they're on the internet, right? And, but at, at the same time, we know that about each other. So there's all kinds of ways of uh, relativizing, qualifying, doing things with the kinds of information that we encounter. So I don't know if I'd right away simply describe it as belief. Um, I think what I find interesting is that question of how is it you know, that people deal with that and engage. And I think on the one hand, you, you have certain kinds of encounters and discourses and dialogues taking place uh, in which there's a kind of either a presumption or a projection of authenticity. Um, and then the question is, yeah, what do you do with that in there are certain kinds of moments when that gets pressured or when that gets undermined? Uh, and then at the same time, in other kinds of settings, there's you know, the, the presumptions of performativity. So I think that's very interesting in relation to the question of belief, is the ways in which belief is, is performed and undermined or disbelief is performed. Um, so I think in terms of how I'm thinking about it, um, you know, I'd, I'd have those kinds of questions. It's about the performativity and about the kinds of practices in relation, <coughs> excuse me, practices in relation to discourses and belief in relation to disbelief. Um, I don't know if that helps, but I don't know. I think I'd have questions about if the internet forum, uh, ultimately, if the logic of it is different. I mean, there's certain things that are different because you don't have face to face communication, so it works differently, but at the same time, the logic of, of you know, deception and authenticity in communication and belief and disbelief, I think, would be the same on the internet, even though, you know, you, it, it finds a different form, but I wouldn't say necessarily, I wouldn't start from the starting point that belief is, a, is more privileged on the internet than those other aspects. Peter, you sort of jumped up. Were you going to intervene on belief or are you passing? Your body language suggested an idea. Uh, body language, yes. Um, no, I think the, uh, the question of belief is indeed much more complicated uh, as I, I see it. Uh, anthropological research shows that many people cannot even think in the terms of belief. So it's a, it's a Christian concept which is posed on. Uh, a whole variety of experiences and practices. So, 
it's a, it's a very complicated term, let's put it like that, and therefore uh, the question which are mostly posed in uh, early encounters, forms of communication you may say, when people start fishing Captain Cook or uh, when people come for the first <laughs> time somewhere. Uh, all these natives believe in something, but that is generally seen as, uh, as, as much more complicated because the, the, the conceptual universe in which belief functions in European languages is quite different from how it functions in other languages. So that, that, is, that is simply a, a very general term. But I think I jumped up a little bit earlier about secularization and secularism. I think what Mark is saying, the teleology of, uh, say, um, the disappearance of, uh, of religion and uh, the victory of uh, the secular, is indeed uh, very much a part of modernization theory, which was the major uh, social science paradigm after the Second World War. So it's the whole idea um, from people from Clifford Girls to Parsons to everyone. Basically, we were thinking of well, these things will be there, but they will not have any place anymore. They are marginalized. So people will make the world will modernize in such a way that um, people may have religion as a kind of afterthought or uh, like you go to a soccer game or whatever. Um, now, that has not happened. Let's put it like that it has not happened. Even people like Michael Walser told me, uh, which I found weird, uh, yeah, we believe that it would, uh, uh, they all believe that it would disappear, but God, God didn't agree, which I think is a nonsensical way of looking at these things. But, um, so this is, a, is, I think, a very general paradigm. And I also, I think, in Marxism and, and, and uh, communist realities, uh, there was simply an attack. Straightforward, not a separation of church, uh, state and church. It's a straightforward state attack on religion to get it out of the way because one had to become different, modern. So all these things have collapsed. And uh, even discussions in France about state and church separation. Now we have a clear case, right? France has its very beautiful ideas, like Cité, very long already. It's damn unclear. It's very difficult, and they are now more and more forced to engage it again. So I think what the post-secular is, is that we are not anymore so happy anymore uh, about everything is going in this way. And so, so I, I agree with that. Uh, the general perspective, uh, we, we have now to figure out new ways of looking at it. And um, indeed, I think internet communication is one, one major part, uh, and you can uh, now, some of the research has shown that people, indeed, who had practices which they found, which were embodied, which were also social, in a social environment, suddenly in, in situation of migration, etc., have to question themselves again, what are we doing? And then find on the internet answers, which may actually be posed in terms of belief and the answers to belief. So, they have strange ways in which uh, uh, you have actually kind of reborn or born again Muslims or born again Christians, all these people who just figure out through the internet what it is to be a Christian. Well, when I was a Christian, uh, my parents told me what to do, right? So uh, the internet is a different kind of uh, way of engaging that question. So uh, that, that, that these are parts of the, the story we have to uh, look at now. And that is part, I think, of the post uh, The 10 from two different directions. One is from um, the, the work on empiricism, which um, has been done by Return to Empiricism, the Theory of the Person, by people like uh, Manuel de Landa. And it's a return to you and uh, the whole uh, of theory of, uh, of belief, in the, the role of belief in the constitution of the person. The other one is the work by Marizio Lazzarato, who has recently discovered Gabriel Tart's model of social society. And yes, it's very interesting, um, he's revamped his very interesting ideas about the social aspect which is constituted by this kind of basic flow, which is flow of beliefs, uh, uh, desires and affects. And now this is a kind of bottom-up <laughs> version of, of society. And these uh, uh, questions help because I do believe that the internet uh, indirectly, you know, also with an effect of mainstream media or culture at large, at large, 
has contributed to pull the ground out of all uh, certain knowledges, has contributed to kind of cognitive chaos, which has been made up by a very strong insistence on subjective uh, beliefs that you find everywhere. You know, some of them are secular, some of them are not secular. But if you look at the interactions of people who do not believe the same thing, you know, as you can find them in groups, but you know, interaction between groups who actually clash, everything, everything seems to happen at a very subjective level. So this is why I'm interested in the terms of belief. I'm thinking also of uh, William James, The Will to Believe, and other popular essays on, uh, on religion, to understand not how religion functions in general, but how it functions with the particular context, which is the distributed communication of the internet. This is what the spirit of uh, my using this term belief. Uh, I was very intrigued by the role of sexuality in your talk. It was uh, very cheeky, very funny, it was everywhere, from the title to the conclusion to various bits in between. I wonder if you could say a little bit more, more about the methodology um, of this, from uh, the title itself, and there were references to pimping the self, and, uh, and uh, oaring the name for the nation, and the witches' naked bodies the homoeroticism of Whitman and the final closing kiss between Bush and the, um, what, Could you say a little bit more about this way of introducing a like, multi-layered interdisciplinary approach, this kind of queer twist? And then secondly, what about the sex appeal of death, of the corpse? There was a lot of death in the talk, of course, um, but what about the representation of the corpse, the presence, the, the taboos of the corpse, but what about the I don't want to pronounce the term, but death drives included. And what about a sort of a fascination for the, the body and when it, in that liminal state, when it is just between the body and the corpse, that twilight zone, and where again, internet and communication technology captures interesting moments where you're neither alive nor dead, you're hanging somewhere in a peculiar type of eternity. So there's a sec second question about Thanatos, really death, but it's a tragic question. Well, I think it's uh, I'm looking for ways to talk about uh, sexuality for, for two reasons. One, I mean, one is to queer the discussion, and the other one is to get at a very fundamental issue. Um, and you know, the ways in which this is just a, a, a returning aspect of the interrelation, but it really doesn't get talked about very much. And and the most uh, really that does get talked about is women and what's happening with women. Uh, but the whole question of, of the ways in which, I mean, once you start looking for it, it comes very, very easily. Um, so, in part, that was my methodology. I just kept bumping into it, and then I thought, okay, well, I'll include it. Um, but I'm still looking for ways to do that uh, more structurally and more incisively. I don't think I did it very incisively, um, but that it's simply that by de being there, it, always, it already gives it a little bit of a shift. Um, About that, um, well, I think I, first I have I both I'm thinking about it, and then at the same time I have this question for you: what's what's that state between life and death that gets captured? I mean, it seems to me so fleeting that I don't know where you would actually see it. Uh, I was thinking of Abu Ghraib photographs, where you're looking at something that is neither here nor there. You, it could, it hasn't really happened. I'm sure it has, but believe mm -hmm. it. It's part of a whole pornographic genre and, 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 and um, yeah, a whole tradition of doing a certain mode of humiliation of the body. But in, in, and then the taboo of actual corpses, which are not allowed to show, I don't think television never shows it. Some, some of the big impact of Fitna, which we have a lecture series on Fitna as well, running concurrently with this. And, and uh, we've talked a lot about the pornography of death and, and how one of the strong points about Fitna is actually it shows you dismembered bodies, it shows you just the corpses in all of their horrendous splendor and throws it into your face with a, with a glee and a delight that is seriously perverse and which makes it a really interesting document. So, but you have to go to something like this, which I would call absolute pornography, and then my, my paper on Fitna was on pornography, to get to what is absolutely censored in the media, which you said is censored by the US military, which is actually the spectacle of the body when it is no longer a body but a corpse. And so there's a strange taboo on that, and yet a kind of a constant flirtation with violence, but it's very niche and delighted disruption that, that is very sexual in some very sick sense of the term, in my sort of, um, sort of life oriented, healthy sexuality. <laughs> uh, I you're the of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's, a, it's not, it's a liminal 
state is nothing new, nothing, and it's because we're, we're getting it as images, we're getting it as news reels or as videos or as photos, that's what I meant. Yeah, I mean, because I think I, I tend to, to see those bodies as, in, uh, you know, in the Abu Ghraib pictures, as, as violated, sexualized, rape, you know, those sorts of things. Um, to me, Death, I mean, there is a picture of one of the men who was killed, and then you have a picture of him being, of him packed in, in ice, and his face kind of distorted, and uh, so that was somebody who was killed, and there was an investigation about how did he get killed. So you see that dead body, um, and you have lots of pictures of people, you know, running with children that have been killed or wounded or maimed. But I also think, you know, and then at the same time, it makes me think about that you have, you know, it depends on, on cultural conventions and so forth. So when I came to Holland, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me was just that you saw much more of it on Dutch TV. Um, and, and just seeing at a certain point, uh, you know, how the, during the news they just showed how a Palestinian got caught in crossfire uh, when he's trying to protect his son and gets shot and blood gushes from his head and I just thought I had to throw up. I've never seen anything like that. Um, so that wasn't so much a fascination or, a, you know, a, sexualization or anything like that. Um, and in Greece they show even more. I don't know what it's like in Italy. Um, but I think, you know, I, what, what I'm thinking about is there's a poem there's a, in, in London. Um, there was a woman who was called the Lyrical Terrorist. And uh, she liked to write poems on the internet. And one of the poems she writes is a poem where she's describing cutting off somebody's head. Um, as part of a jihadi um, killing and the pleasure of it and the ways in which she describes what's happening to the body as the head is being cut off. Uh, and to me that was a rape poem rather than a death poem. Um, so I don't know, I'm not very experienced in talking about death. Um, and I think that that's, that's, so it makes it difficult for me to answer your question. And I also can't think of that many um, images of death in a way, but I'm sure once I start looking for them, so that's something I'll be looking for and seeing how I can talk about. But because you, you do terror so well, I think part of the effect of terror is dismembered bodies. I mean, and again, we have to go to places that fit nobody was on the internet before to see the scene of the American doctor was decapitated, where you see the decapitation. I mean, Wilders shows it, and then you hear the voice going as they hold up the decapitated head, and the sound is still going on. And it is one of the true moments of, of, of horror in that uh, film. So um, I would call this thanography, not, not pornography, it's a pornography of death, and because actually it is a spectacle, and, and there is obvious glee and delight on the part of the perpetuity. Perpetuators, and there is a great deal, at least in me, of shame in sitting there being forced to watch it, which means the other element in the discussion we had yesterday with the law family, the element of shame in being forced to witness this play a real, real big role. I had exactly the same reaction with the jihadist boy saying, I'm going to go to paradise after I kill all of you guys out there because I prefer the women of paradise to the women on earth. And I find that thanography is, is the pornography of death again, and that she has sexual delight in the distraction. I would have that reaction no matter what religion you would be doing this for, um, but I call this serious death pornography, and, and, and I wonder what kind of sexuality is involved in this, and what kind of, I might, again, old-fashioned language, but perverse pleasure, unless we are prepared to reopen the chapter, sexuality and death, in relation to the spectacle of terror and that we're all forced to watch on a daily basis. And this is one of the most, for me, the most disturbing features of the post-secular condition, that in some ways I feel that this conversation is almost inevitable, although I'd much rather not go there if I could. Um, but it seems that the political context makes it difficult to avoid. Well, I'm only, well, I think there's two things. One thing I just thought of, I think what's crucial is the numerology, right, so the statistics. Um, so I think that's, that's probably the way in which I most commonly encounter death in relation to terror and so forth, is numbers of people killed, numbers of this, numbers of that. Um, so, and there's all sorts of discussions, right, about the relations to, to, between statistics and states and sovereignty and hegemony and so forth, discipline. Um, but the other thing I'm wondering is, uh, for you, is all pleasure in death uh, perverse? What kind is it? 
not at all. I'm not just saying that there is a that take it back to fraud and the death trial, that there is a peculiar type of sexiness to death, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't have so many representations of it and so much censorship going on it. But I, I think it is an element of the, the present political context, whether you get it from fitna or from the propaganda videos of the various and religions. And, uh, is an element of this. There is a, a shifting relationship to death and dying as part of, the, of this entire political scene. Um, whether it is even Sarah Paley is a killer, she kills animals, but I wouldn't want to be in her line of fire and put it in this. The Nazi. There is a lot of killing, there's a lot of death being thrown around in the context of a discourse that is about something else and of this pleasure and on the part of the people that are presenting this to us. Not to me as a spectator, shame is what comes, which is a very old-fashioned emotion. I don't know whether you watch Fitna and you had the same thing. I shouldn't be looking at this. I don't want to be looking at this. And yet I'm forced to be looking at this. I think whatever that is, is for me one of the dark sides, uh, problematic side of the post-secular uh, condition. No, I, I think sexuality is not only connected to this, but there is sexuality in death as well. Yeah, no, and I agree, and I think, you know, what you were saying now just makes me think that, that uh, it, what's interesting is in the reactions after 9-11, uh, you had a number of uh, American uh, military and uh, intelligence personnel and so forth that uh, got ready to try and track down bin Laden. And then the kinds of terms that they were using were very graphic terms, like, okay, we're going to, you know, set up pikes with heads on them, and we're going to have flies walking on their eyeballs, and, you know, and, and this was very distinctive for the kinds of this was unique for the kinds of language that usually was used in those circles. Um, so you do have that kind of and, and a perverse pleasure because it kept being repeated and then there's jokes and can you send some ice for the head and you know things like that. So um, so you have that kind of perverse pleasure in bodily imagery, grotesque bodily imagery of death of the enemy. Um, you know, and of course there's ritualized aspects and so forth. Interesting to try to track where those images come from. Vietnam War, heads on sticks and uh, rotting bodies on swamps, where the, the cultural imaginary of this image, of this repertoire, would be coming from. One last element of this, because the time is up, in that wonderful uh, documentary that the French guys made on, on the Twin Towers, September 11. You know, there was one documentary from the man who was filming with a fire brigade, and he was trapped inside one of the towers, and he filmed it all. I suppose you've seen it, it's shown every September 11. One of the most striking things for me in the documentary related to death is that as they're inside, you hear these funky noises. You hear plop, 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 plop. And after a while, you realize that what you're hearing is the bodies falling. And there are so many that it is just extraordinary. Those images that we will never see, except the people in New York who have seen it. And, uh, will never recover, but it was the acoustic traces of death on a massive scale that I thought was one of the most powerful moments in terms of defeating the visual saturation of this and yet making the point that this is really a sea of dead bodies that we're trying to swim in. Did you, did you, did anybody else, was anybody else struck by this? Am I the only one? We don't want to see that. <laughs> well, you don't see, you just we don't hear. hear it. <laughs> I don't want to be here. Anybody else for the last round, for the last three minutes? Thank you very much for a very lively discussion for a wonderful paper. Come back soon and we look forward to hearing more from you in the months to come. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for your questions.